Thank you, Dana. And uh, again, good morning, everyone. Um, so we really started out uh, with Brett's overview in terms of really, if you will, kind of the leading edge of where our industry is at in terms of personalized medicine. Rob gave you a great overview of how we've implemented total cancer care uh, at Moffitt. Uh, Dan has given you, again, also sort of an overview from a data governance perspective. Uh, and I'm going to finish up this section before we open it up for questions to all of you, really around how we went about implementing uh, our overall information technology architecture. I do want to underscore one point that Dana made, which is that you know, prior to coming to Moffitt, I had been involved in a number of healthcare-related uh, data warehousing um, and analytics efforts, both successful and unsuccessful. And oftentimes, we do enter into these very much as an IT initiative, and that's rarely successful by itself. So a key role that Dana has played at Moffitt is really, if you will, thinking of it as uh, the information architect, really thinking about the data and how that interrelates together. And that makes uh, my role as a CIO much more successful in terms of thinking about how we implement and support the technology uh, that wraps around that. So in, in any important large initiative like this, it's always important to understand sort of what our end goals are. Uh, so we developed these long before we made any type of technology selection or implementation. The goals of the platform really were to establish a flexible data integration management and analysis platform to address patient-specific outcomes research, as we've been talking about. It's also to provide the ability to query the very large volume of data uh, that we have been collecting at Moffitt as a part of this total cancer care study. To create an information architecture that supports localized disease program research through the centralized data hub. So you've heard reference to the hub and spoke architecture that's really been a critical design principle for us to have very high quality, robust, um, highly curated data at the central hub and at Moffitt specifically through our disease programs, whether that's clinical outcomes or whether it's more basic science research, to be able to surface that data into those spoke level databases uh, and allow each of those programs to collect their own data elements for their own individual study. And then over time, that allows us to incorporate that collected data back into the hub. So it's really designed, again, as a very robust and flexible model. And then certainly to advance Moffitt's ability to repurpose this data for research needs by linking together the key domains, as we see it, in terms of clinical molecular biospecimen and epidemiological and health outcomes data. And then finally, and this is uh, really the reference that Brett made in terms of the ongoing healthcare learning system, at point of care to be able to provide clinicians and patients with all of the available treatment options and their comparative effectiveness to personalized decision making, really to achieve that end goal. So this is an outline time slide of, of how we implemented this. Our efforts on this particular journey uh, for the Health and Research Informatics platform really started in earnest about 18 months ago. Uh, instead of kind of going down the usual path of sending out an RFI to several technology uh, vendors, what we realized was to really deliver on the vision that we had with Total Cancer Care, it was truly going to take a partnership. Uh, and so we were really looking for, um, many ways, solutions partners to work with us. So we put together what was called a, a request for concept. And within that RFC was a series of vignettes or use cases really describing how individuals, whether they're clinicians, researchers, administrators, et cetera, would leverage this platform and we invited uh, a variety of technology companies to respond back to us in terms of how they would implement that. So at the end of the day, um, Oracle really, for us, really provided the best vision that was most consistent. Obviously, their reputation and the work that they've done on the data warehousing side and the work that they've done in terms of the health sciences industry played a major role in our selection for them as well. Um, phase zero was really uh, standing up the data governance processes that Dana has spoken to and really defining the scope for the overall platform that we were building. And then phase one, which we're about to go live with uh, within the next couple of weeks, was designing the core of that platform so that we could support Moffitt researchers who wanted to be able to identify patient cohorts at their desktops, literally by putting in the inclusion exclusion criteria. And when I finish up in a couple of slides, I'll turn it back over to Deanna and she'll actually show you some screenshots of how we've enabled that through a tool, a front end tool we, uh, that's called Transmed. Phase two, which we're in the process now of putting our scoping uh, discussions around, really has three major components for us. The first of that is expanding out the clinical data components that we want to be able to bring in to do more health outcomes focused studies, 
uh, as well as really more in-depth analyses uh, around linking together that clinical data with molecular data, which is the second leg of that very important sort of three-legged stool as a part of phase two. And then the third piece is incorporating a lot of the data that's been collected at our total cancer care consortium sites and being able to really look across that data. So this is a slide of our reference architecture. Um, I won't go into too much detail around this, but just to give you a sense of uh, how we designed this and implemented, kind of starting on the, on the left-hand side, uh, we walk through uh, what the various source systems are, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about those specifically. But in many data warehousing platforms, at a high level, this isn't too unusual for what some of you may have been used to if, you're interest, if you've been involved in these types of efforts. It's essentially bringing the data in, and another key partner for us uh, was Deloitte. Uh, we actually helped them sort of stand up what was been called sort of a data factory, which is an offshoring uh, group in India that has really done a lot of the heavy lifting along with some of our own technology folks within Moffitt to do a lot of the extract and transformation and loading into uh, the interface tables. And then really the core of the EHA model that Oracle has provided is the healthcare data model. So this was a really very much designed, we felt it was sort of 85 to 90 percent there in terms of being able to buy that very robust data model that we can bring the data into. Uh, and Dan, I sort of walked you through a little bit some of the challenges we have around how you normalize data across all of these various source systems. So that's really ultimately what an important component of this piece is. And then speaking to the hub and spoke architecture, having spoke data marts and other types of, uh, again, clinical program and disease program or research program specific databases that surface the core high quality data uh, from the hub and allow them to collect their own data elements as well. In terms of the information architecture, so for phase one, what we focused on was most primarily cancer registry data because that was already high quality abstracted data uh, by, by very certified and uh, qualified resources. LabVantage is our biorepository system, so bringing in the histologic and pathologic data from that system. Capstone, uh, we bring in demographics uh, and some other registration information. Cell files, uh, so for the genetic expression data, we're not bringing that data in in phase one. We are looking at that for phase two. What we do have is pointers to the cell files and metadata, so we can understand, for example, some of the QC components of those cell files, et cetera. Galvanon um, is a vendor product, but what it really refers to is our electronic patient questionnaire. So all patients who sign up for the total cancer care protocol uh, complete an electronic patient questionnaire, as do really over 90% of the patients who are seen at Moffitt. Um, it takes them about 45 minutes to complete. It's a pretty robust tool that was developed by a population scientist and epidemiologist. Uh, we're able to collect a lot of very rich um, patient self-reported data. We also provision that through our Cerner clinical system to, to provide us so that they have that information at point of care even before uh, they, they first set eyes on the patient. And finally, 3M, we bring in some coding data and other information. So again, we've covered some of this already, but the core components of this are really developing the data domains, if you will. So for us, it's demographics, cancer staging, diagnosis, treatment, drugs, and labs, and then being able to focus specifically on finding patient cohorts based on those specific data domains. So with that, I will turn it back to Dana, who's going to walk you through some screenshots so you can see the product that we're actually delivering directly to the researchers. Thanks again, Mark. We just quickly go through some of these screenshots, and I think it'll give you a feel for the power of being able to query the database. If you picture really hundreds of end users at Moffitt who are able to quickly identify whether there are patient subgroups available for their own research or for a clinical trial matching. Again, as we look to aggregate the data across the 18 sites Rob described, it's really a powerful tool. So these are very pretty simple technologies, but um, you'll see that they address some of the nuances of the data that are important to consider for data warehousing. So this is pretty straightforward. You can, you can see this is the transmed screen. Um, you navigate through variables at the left pane, and then this is the results window that basically tells you how many patients fit the criteria that you're defining using the variables here. And this you'll see, uh, I'll allude to in a future slide, is what they they call the breadcrumb. It allows you to see how you're filtering down and how your cohort becomes smaller and smaller as you hone in on the relevant subgroup. Uh, this is nice as, in, as someone who works with data myself. If you're looking, for example, at a, a laboratory value or any other 
numeric value, you can actually quickly group the cohort by quintile, quartile, or uh, particular categories that you custom define. And with the click of a button, you have the distribution of your cohort by those categories. So it's uh, actually kind of cool if you're someone who likes to play with data. Um, this is an example of actually using uh, these choice lists to filter your cohort. So for example, this, this example is ethnicity, but if you are looking at histology, let's say you're not a clinician and you're just interested in all breast histologies, you can actually use the search feature here, type breast in, and then it'll pull up every histology related to breast. You can then click on those relevant histologies that you would like to include in your definition. And again, with a click of the button, identify the number of patients in the database that fit that uh, histology. We also have several dates. Now, the way we handle dates, I mentioned that everyone has access to de-identify data. So within the TransMed tool, it offsets all dates by up to 45 days. This way, you're not looking at PHI, but for every patient, each date associated with that given patient is offset by the same number of days. So it preserves all of the time intervals between events. Therefore, you can query on time intervals between events without actually seeing the date itself. This is one aspect that I thought was particularly important to highlight. Um, in cancer research, many times patients have multiple primaries. And actually at Moffitt, 30% of our patients have multiple primaries, whether it's two different breast primaries or a skin primary followed by a lung primary. And the challenge with this is making sure that when you're querying on any cl clinical diagnosis treatment characteristics, that you are linking those characteristics to the relevant diagnosis. So in this example, we have one patient who actually has both a lung cancer diagnosed in 2009 and a cutaneous malignancy in 2010. And the adenocarcinoma histology is what's associated with the cutaneous malignancy. If you did not perform what we call a linked query, and you were just interested in patients who had adenocarcinomas of the lung, let's say, and you didn't specifically indicate that you wanted the histology of adenocarcinoma to refer to the lung and not the cutaneous episode, then you would have that patient coming up in a query inappropriately. And this happened in our old data warehouse, if you will. It was very difficult to tease apart the multiple primaries. And so we've worked very closely with Oracle and TransMed to display these linked queries. And so I'm gonna show you two different screenshots. One query run, not linked, and another query, the identical query, run in a linked format, and you can see the difference. So here we have, uh, we're querying on histology here and primary site. And we're interested, again, in adenocarcinoma of the lung, but we have not linked this query. And so we see 30 patients are falling into this cohort. And if you look at the histologies and the primary sites, you can see that we do have an adenocarcinoma of the lung here, but here we have someone who has an adenocarcinoma of a different primary site. Now they also had a lung cancer diagnosis in order to fall into this query, but their lung cancer was not an adenocarcinoma. And so you inappropriately identify patients that fit a certain set of criteria. Let's say now you go write a grant based on this number of 30, you get IRB approval and funding, and two years later, you're ready to do your study and find out, mm, actually, there aren't 30 patients, there are fewer patients. And in this case, uh, there were only 24, that when you actually linked the histology to the primary site and said, I don't want people who just have a lung cancer and an adenocarcinoma, but I specifically want people who had an adenocarcinoma of the lung. Now, this number goes down to 24. And you can see they've designed this cute little chain link icon to, 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 to note to the end user that this is an actual linked query. And you can double check this by now seeing that all of the histologies are actually paired with primary site long. So this is a key feature for our investigators who are querying the database and for uh, those who are looking to do clinical trial matching. 
Another interesting feature, of course, we've all seen Venn diagrams, but the nice way of displaying data for cohort identification using Venn diagrams is that you can actually overlay different sets of criteria and then double click on their intersection. And in this case, if I were to, if this were live, I double click on the 239 and all of the patients falling into that would appear to me. So I could define one set of criteria uh, and overlap it with another. This is a nice way of presenting, for example, patients who fit certain clinical demographic criteria overlaid with those who have a TCC consent that's active and a tumor tissue that has a cell file available. And you can overlay them and nicely see the intersection. And the final example I wanted to show you over the screenshots involve querying longitudinal data which can be relevant for population scientists, but more specifically for clinicians who want to look at actual patterns of events that are occurring over time. And so this feature is really user-friendly. Uh, you can just drag any variable that you want that has a date associate, associated with it into the window and then indicate by their succession from left to right which comes first. You can also specify a, a minimum or maximum time interval between events, as well as a time window for the entire pattern. And so using this type of longitudinal query, you can save the pattern and then run a filter on that pattern and identify patients that fit that particular clinical pattern. This is very useful for looking at treatment patterns, looking at the timing of different treatments. So yes, you can identify people who have had radiation and surgery, but if you're trying to look at the effect of the timing of the drugs relative to each other, again, this tool can be very helpful in doing this with a click of the button at your desktop. So that's uh, just a flavor of some of the features we've worked uh, hard to propagate into the end user tool to really uh, facilitate access to HRI for, for different users. And I think that's the end of our formal slides. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>